Welcome everyone to Webinar Wednesday hosted by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Uh, my name is Scott with Vector Corrosion Technologies and as usual I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, we're mere days away from uh, Valentine's Day so you know love is in the air and I, and I happen to know you are going to love this presentation on structural strengthening with fiber reinforced polymers today. So we'll get this show on the road here. Um, you know that the Concrete Preservation Alliance hosts these webinars by drawing on all of our, our members uh, throughout the world uh, to uh, share their experience and expertise in the field of concrete preservation and infrastructure renewal. I want to give some airtime to our, our uh, members right here. They range from Vector Corrosion Technologies all the way to IEC and Aquar, um, SEP. They're all over the world and they save structures every day uh, and we hope you do too. So. Thank you for that. If you've joined us here today, you've obviously been to the website uh, wesavestructures.info, which is the home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance. If you click on the events tab at the top, you'll see two other menu items there, one for parking structures and one for uh, bridge preservation. Uh, the bridge preservation series was last year uh, and all the videos uh, from those webinars as well as the slide decks are posted up there for your, your viewing pleasure. And if, you look, if you're looking to register for our, our last webinar of the Parking Structure Series, which is coming up in March, uh, you can go to that tab of Parking Structures and you can also find all of the old, um, the past um, slide decks and, and videos there as well. So please come back often. Uh, the content does change. We're, we're lagging a bit, but we're trying to keep up with it. Um, we hope you, uh, you value uh, the Concrete Preservation Alliance and we save structures.info. On to the main show for today. Mr. Andrew Brecker is joining us uh, from Vector Construction. He's a project developer and he specializes in restoration and corrosion protection of reinforced concrete structures. He's been doing this a long time, over 13 years. Uh, his background is in construction engineering. He also has a certification from NACE or uh, AMP, which is the uh, Cathodic Protection or Corrosion Protection uh, National Standards Body. And he's at the highest level you can possibly be at a CP4. The um, throughout the years in the industry, he's um, he's uh, uh, he's been, he's been with Vector and gained a lot of experience in condition evaluations, non-destructive testing, cathodic protection, uh, post-tension repair. Basically, he's done it all. And here he's here to talk to us about fiber reinforced polymer strengthening uh, today. He enjoys helping clients out with the rehabilitation strategies and their concrete problems. And as I say just learned today, Andrew uh, loves a good gin and tonic and uh, some cured meat. He says that would be a pre fine end to a good project. So Andrew, over to you, sir. We have uh, a nice photo here uh, with, I believe this is you in your natural habitat on a lift, correct? Correct, yeah, on a boom lift, that's me. Um, yeah, I was asked to you know, put in a, a, a picture of myself uh, installing this FRP product, and that's the best picture I was able to find. Apparently I take a lot of pictures, um, but uh, I'm not in many of them. So um, yeah, right here with my, let's see, start the pointer here. Here with the back to the camera is me and we're wrapping this column on the right here um, with FRP. So um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Um, what we're gonna cover here um, is just, uh, you know, FRP structural strengthening um, and with the focus on installation and, uh, and parking structures specifically. So the topics we'll cover is are what is FRP, um, just some common uses of FRP, um, some considerations when setting up an FRP project or selecting FRP for strengthening. Um, we'll go through the typical installation process uh, and you know focus on on fabric FRPs mostly. Um, there's so many different uses and kinds of FRPs that you could talk about it all day, but that's what we'll mostly cover. And also we'll look at a couple of case studies here, um, some examples of FRP installations on parking structures. So this slide shows the concrete preservation process. And if you've seen any of the other webinars, you've probably seen this slide or visited the website. So um, just highlighted a couple areas we'll be looking at and talking about today. Um, structural criteria, evaluation, and material selection as it relates to FRP and the environments we're putting it in. Yeah. And then also just the strengthening at FRP as a strengthening tool is one of the repair methods. 
and then also focus on some of the quality control, which is very important when you're installing FRP. So we don't know what is FRP and just a just a big kind of high level overview here um, from ACI 440. It states FR, fiber reinforced polymer FRP systems for strengthening concrete structures are used as an alternative to traditional strengthening techniques, such as steel plate bonding, section enlargement, and external post tension. So FRP composites, you know, have been used in many different applications, and then they're fairly common now for for years. You know, whether it's a high end bicycle or a car or just about anything you can think of now has been made with with carbon fiber or FRP. Um, so here we're going to be focusing on the uses for strengthening concrete structures. Um, the FRP strengthening systems um, use composite materials that have high tensile strengths and low weights. And, and versus steel, that's one of the major benefits is they're thinner, lighter, and just more st tensile strength and, and, and lighter, lower weight. So we'll continue our what is FRP here and the, and the two materials that we're going to be talking about here in this presentation that make up make up these different types of FRP. Um, we typically have carbon fiber reinforced polymer and glass fiber reinforced polymer. So here you can see the difference pictures in, in the black stuff is the carbon fiber reinforced polymer fabric here and then the white stuff is would be the glass glass fiber reinforced polymer. Um, also come in very different types for both carbon and glass. They come, you know, a unit or directional fabric, a bi-directional fabric, or laminate strips and rods. Here we have a picture of a laminate strip. So this is very thin and, and small laminate strip. It's something that would typically be embedded in a saw cut. Um, here's our unidirectional fabric. Both these pictures are of unidirectional fabric. You can see the, the uh, strands of the FRP going in one direction. If it was bi-directional, you'd see strands going in both directions. So I'll cover some some typical applications here. Um, of course, it may be used on concrete, you know, also masonry, wood, or steel structures for strengthening. Um, it can strengthen structures for flexor, flexural loads, shear, and axial loads. Um, you know, you have surface mounted or near surface mounted options. Here's a picture on the right of surface mounted and they're strengthening these double T's for both flexural and shear. Um, you have seismic upgrading is a common use for it. Um, it creates a nice heavy duty barrier and coating in addition to strengthening, which is also a benefit. Um, and replace lost or damaged reinforcing steel on the structure. Um, it's very commonly used in change of use or, or new loading added to the structure and also used in historic structures because it, it blends well with the aesthetics of the structure and doesn't require a lot of overbuilds. On the bottom here you can see it's another use of combining, combining some pedestal column repairs here with glass fiber reinforced polymer. Continue with some major benefits. Um, they're made of non-corrosive materials, so both carbon and glass um, won't corrode like steel would. Conforms to structure aesthetics. Uh, it's low profile and lightweight. You're adding less dead load to the structure. Um, no heavy equipment is required for placing the FRP. It's you know typically done by hand and with some fairly minimal access requirements. It's also fast and easy to install. So this allows you to install it in places such as this, which is about 100 feet up in the air inside of a concrete dome structure. It'd be difficult to access with heavy steel or any other material, but it's fairly easy to get FRP up there in the boom lift. And also the, the picture down low here, we have some laminate strips installed on the socket of a slab. And so this would be a major benefit in something like a parking structure. Um, where you would, wouldn't affect the clearance in that structure as much as maybe putting in a steel beam or something like that. So it allow cars to still drive through that area and you might be able to keep your, your pickup truck traffic or something like that in the structure. Uh, 
some more considerations, um, project specific considerations when it comes to setting up these projects um, is just access. What is the access like to the installation area? That's always, always a major consideration in just about any construction project you do. Um, installation time window, it's FRP is very fast and simple to install, which is a benefit when it comes to, you know, probably not parking structures, but other areas where shutdowns are required, such as industrial facilities. Um, you know, helps you meet new building codes, maybe with an older structure. Um, service temperatures, you know, what's the temperature like in the area you're installing it? If it's a uh, high temperatures, epoxies typically don't like the high heat, so there might be a different option that works better, but um, that's just something to consider. Um, submersion in water, you know, if there's active reinforcing steel corrosion, you don't want to cover up the reinforcing steel corrosion. Um, impact or abrasion and wear resistance if that's required. Uh, chemical resistance, something to consider. Your budget, you know, is it, it's usually fairly economical, but you know, in some cases it might be, might be cheaper to, or more budget friendly to put in uh, steel. You just you kind of weigh your options there. And protective coatings. Um, whether it's you need a fire coating, fire resistant coating, um, coating for protect against UV exposure, or just as aesthetics. So you can see an example of uh, the aesthetic coating here on the lower picture. We had it's been painted to match the existing ceiling, and then it's also been labeled to protect it from drilling or cutting um, from future construction work. And then on the right side here, we've got FRP installed in a harsh environment. So this is a cooling tower in North Dakota. So it sees a wide variety of temperature swings, you know, from really cold in the winter to hot in the summer, and also sees um, moisture and that kind of thing. So consider what, continue with the considerations here is our corrode consideration for the corrosion risk of the structure. So again, from ACI 440, um, you sh FRP should not be installed if there's active corrosion of the reinforcing steel in the structure. Um, the expansive forces from this corrosion can likely damage and affect, damage the concrete behind the FRP and affect the integrity of the FRP strengthening itself. So before you install any FRP in these areas, um, the cause of the corrosion should be addressed. So from the pictures right here, we do see that there has been some corrosion damage um, from corroding reinforcing steel. And to address that, they've done the repairs and they're installing galvanic anodes in cord holes. Here the anodes are ready to be grouted in and hanging from the column before they finally wrap the column with FRP. We'll move on to a typical project process for an FRP project. Um, some of the pre-construction items that we'll go through uh, usually starts with the condition evaluation and assessment of the damages. Uh, as you can see on the right here, you, you make note of any lost reinforcing steel. So in this case, you've got quite a few bars that have been corroded through and are no longer there. Um, locate any reinforcement. If you don't know the spacing, GPR, cover meter helps to, to find the spacing and the reinforcement in the structure. Um, there you can do a structural analysis um, to determine the additional strength requirements of the structure, if any. And, and then from that point on, you can de develop the project drawings and specifications, um, identify the areas that need strength. Um, develop budget estimate, and then you can start working with your FRP designer and supplier to come up with the, the installation details and the stamped calculations and drawings. Um, broken out bidding the actual job down here and it because because it can take place in multiple different locations of this process. Um, we've seen it seen it in all you know these locations and others from you know, just after the condition evaluation, they decide they need strengthening and ask, you know, the owner asks for a bid on that strengthening and then you have to complete all the extra steps after the bid. Or you can get it down at the very end after a final 
installation plan after a final, you know, stamped calculations and designs for the FRP are drawn out and dimensioned and you're bidding on that exact dimension drawing. There's a couple typical um, FRP design drawings that we'll see. Um, on the left here is a design for both the flexural strengthening and shear strengthening. Um, we'll typically show the direction of the strands in the fabric and spacing and where to put it um, on the other end. You can just end up with a drawing such as this and basically just showing a hatched area of where strengthening is needed and it's up to you to design and determine the requirements and the dimensions for the install. Move on to the preparation uh, in the project process here, uh, installation preparation. Um, first step is always complete all concrete repairs. Um, take care of that corrosion, um, take care of any repairing any cracks, concrete spallings or delaminations and allow allow time for the repairs to cure. Uh, you don't want to cover over any any poor concrete with your FRP strengthening system. Uh, second would be a layout installation on the structure. Um, confirm the design measurements fit on the structure in the field. Um, locate any obstructions, discrepancies, um, anything that might be in the way that isn't shown on the drawings and make any adjustments as, ne as necessary with the engineer. After that's complete, you would move on to preparing the concrete surface. Uh, typically consists of a grind or a blast um, for surface mounted methods. Um, for near surface mounted, it would be cutting slots. Um, we're gonna focus mostly on the surface mounted here through and we'll cover near surface mounted in a case study later on. So the next step for surface mounted would be to chamfer and round the corners. Uh, you don't want any sharp corners for installing the fabric on the surface of the concrete. Uh, clean or remove dust and debris. Fill any bug holes and imperfections, form lines in the concrete. Um, get everything nice and smooth. Insulate steel from carbon contact, and that's a tricky one. Um, so carbon, uh, the carbon fiber is conductive, so there is a possibility that with that conduction that you could cause a, a small corrosion cell. So you like to insulate any steel that may be on the surface from a rebar or chairs um, from contact with that carbon fiber. And uh, last step is to confirm that after all this present, after, after all this preparation that uh, you've reached the ICRI CSP3 is a typical one we like to get to for the surface, surface mounted carbon fiber. And on the right, you see the ICRI chipset here and shows you where three is about on the smoother side. So we like to have it nice and smooth for FRP. Moving to a couple pictures of this process. So we'll go through here, um, lay out and mark the area. See so here they've marked lines on the structure. They've cleared the coating off the structure where the FRP is going to go. Down low here, we're marking out spaces, marking out rebar, um, locating it for the FRP. And on the right here, we found some near surface metals or some, here is some reinforcing steel that's in contact with the surface after a surface prep. And we wanna make sure to get that insulated from contact with any carbon fiber that we're putting on the structure. Next is rounding the corners. So here you can see this stencil is used to confirm that we've got a nice round corner on this on this beam right here. And also filling any holes or imperfections. So there's a bunch of holes here that have been filled with epoxy to make it nice and smooth. So that's the prep. Now we'll get into the actual installation of the FRP itself. So step one would be to cut all your FRP to size. After you've confirmed where it's going on the structure and taking your measurements, cut it all to make sure that it fits. Um, and then also trim around any obstructions per the design, anything like pipe hangers or anchors. Second would be to prime the concrete surface with epoxy. 
prime the surface of epoxy and allow it to become nice and tacky before we start to install the FRP fabric. While we're waiting for that to become tacky, we'll begin pre-saturating the FRP fabric. So here in the picture, they've got a table made up to saturate the fabric and they're saturating it and using rollers to get that epoxy nice and embedded inside that fabric. Next, once the fabric's installed and the surface is nice and tacky, we'll install that saturated FRP fabric on the structure. You can see a picture on the right here of the guys lifting a, a wet piece of saturated fabric up into place. Once that has been installed on the structure, we'll feather the edges um, with epoxy to make it nice and smooth. We'll allow everything to cure and if necessary, um, we'll install some sort of top coat, whether that's paint or a fire fire protection coating um, or UV coating, anything along those lines. Here again, we'll have some more pictures of the steps. On the left here, the guys are measuring out the long piece of FRP and cutting it. And on the right, the surface has been primed with epoxy. And here is another area where there was steel in contact with the surface. So they've taken a piece of glass of glass FRP and insulated the surface so that the steel does not contact the carbon. Next picture is of the saturation process. So we're on the left again, they're using a table to get that fabric nice and saturated and pictures on the right are, are pictures of the saturated product installed on the beam. In the next slide here, we've got the feathered edges. So making those edges nice and smooth, it helps if you do have to put a second layer of FRP over it and just makes a nice clean finish. Um, on the right here, the guys are installing some fire protection coating over top of the FRP. And then we'll end up with the finished product that may look something like this. And in this case, they did put that fire protection top coat over, and then they also painted it to match the surface of the ceiling, as well as having that stencil that we saw earlier to protect any, any future work from drilling or cutting into that. So anything like putting in new conduit or mechanical penetrations or hanging signage, that kind of thing would be common in a, in a uh, parking structure. You just want to protect against that, especially if you paint over it so you can't tell it's there. So that's the installation process. And uh, during installation, uh, we typically have a, a heavy emphasis on quality control. Um, you want to make sure you got a nice, good bond and good finished product for the structure. So on the right here is our typical, the typical sheet that will fill out for each section. Each member we install FRP on every day. Um, install, it keeps records of things like the date and time, installation locations, ambient conditions and temperatures, the surface temperatures and dryness, the surface preparation profile, you're trying to get it nice and smooth, just confirming that, and also epoxy FR and FRP batch numbers. Um, so, Along with that record keeping, we'll also have field procedures such as creating sample panels that are separate from the structure um, made during this in the same conditions that the structure was in that day. Um, also some bond or adhesion testing to confirm that you have a nice bond with that FRP material to the structure. And also just a physical sounding and, and visual survey for any defects, any delaminations or air bubbles or something that may be trapped in that FRP. Um, you know, and then always should quality control indicate it. You would you would continue testing if there was a problem indicated. Continue testing uh, and assess the situation and repair if necessary. Here are just some picture examples of our bond testing procedure. Usually, uh, you have a sample panel like this put on the structure. Uh, usually right next to where you would typically be installing the FRP. Um, they trace out stencil around a, a dolly for the pull testing and then glue that dolly to the surface using epoxy and use, use this 
machine here to pull it off and measure the PSI for the pull strength. Uh, typical, typically you want to get over 200 PSI is a, is a pretty common one. Um, here is this showing 429 PSI and this test has also pulled some of that substrate off. So, so it looks, it's looking good in this instance. Um, we're not just pulling the FRP off the concrete. We're also getting some of that concrete substrate with the pull. So that covers the basic installation and quality control, and then we'll move on to our case studies here. Um, this first case study is located in Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, Royal University Hospital Parkade Structure. Um, so here, this is where we'll cover some more of the near surface mounted laminate uh, installation steps. Um, So the FRP strengthening scope on this was installation of near surface mounted uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymer um, to provide additional negative moment capacity. Uh, this was a post tension waffle slab and the reasoning for this installation was to bring basically to bring an older structure up to code um, so that it wasn't condemned. I think it was looking at being condemned and possibly tore down. They decided this was an option to bring it up to code. Um, among other repairs on the structure, um, among FRP, there are also other repairs on the structure here. So um, we've got, there is also some drying and regreasing of wet post-tensioning cables and replacement of broken post-tensioning. So what is near surface mounted carbon fiber here? Um, installation of near surface mounted Carbon fiber can increase negative moment or positive moment capacity in structures is where you typically see it used. Um, typically completed using carbon fiber rods or strips. Here on the right is a picture of a strip. On this project, they were actually using rods. So, um, and they were embedded in channels cut in the concrete surface. So surface pride laminate um, can sometimes be used depending on requirements. So this was near surface mounted. There's also a surface mounted option, which we'll touch on in the next two slides. Kind of go jump forward a bit and show the difference. So this would be a near surface mounted application. They've got the slots cut in the concrete and they're in the process of putting the rods in here. And this would show the difference from surface mounted. So this is surface mounted like we have seen in some of the previous slides where you're installing the FRP right on the surface. Um, the major benefits to the near surface mounted over the surface mounted, especially in something like a parking garage where you might anticipate, you know, vehicle or foot traffic is that that near surface mounting in the slots is going to be much more durable when it comes to traffic over top of it than a surface mounted FRP. Something like this would typically require a heavy duty or topping or coating over it to protect it. So we'll get into the actual installation steps here of this project. The near surface mount carbon fiber reinforcement bar are used to install or installed in a channel cut into the concrete surface. So this is how they installed it in this project. Um, special care should be taken to ensure that when creating channel that none of the existing reinforcement is damaged. So you're trying to add, add reinforcing, add strength to the structure. So, so cutting or damaging the reinforcing that is there, it, you're kind of working against yourself. You don't want to do that. Um, so for this project, um, detailed to kind of solve this issue, a detailed ground penetrating radar scan was completed prior to the installation and the cutting of the slots for the FRP. Here we can show that scan. They've got the area laid out and grid lined out where they think the cuts are going to go. Um, they, they're scanning with the GPR here and here to find any areas of low cover. Um, and this is important just because when you're cutting these slots, you don't want to cut too deep and, and damage that reinforcing like we said. And, and when you get slots going in both directions um, to fit the FRP bar in there, of course, one slot has to be deeper than the other slot. 
Um, so in those areas, especially you want to where you're going deeper with your cuts, you want to make sure you're not going to damage any of that existing rebar. This shows what we ended up with after the GPR scanning. You can see some of the scans here taken showing different depths of, of low cover here was at, at zero to, to three quarters of an inch. Here's when you go deeper where the bar starts to show up. So these kind of highlight some of the areas where we had to be careful of cutting. Um, so using these scans, they're able to come up with a detailed plan for cutting to make sure that we didn't damage any of the rebar. So once we have that plan and cutting and know where the existing bar is, we can start cutting. So here we got the, we've got them starting to cut the slots and then chipping the material and cleaning out the inside of those slots. And here's cleaning again, cleaning debris and uh, maybe taking some of those spots where these, where the two directions cross and making them a little bit deeper just so we can fit um, any of the, the, re, the FRP bars kind of crossing each other so we can fit them in there. Um, probably done by hand just so you didn't have to get the big saw in there and risk damaging any of that reinforcing steel down below. So now that we have our slots cut, get into the installation of the bar. So the installation is, is completed by embedding the FR fiber rods in the epoxy resin. Um, the channels are filled with the resin and then the bar is, or the rod is, is pushed down into that resin and then any of the channels are topped off and struck off with epoxy to make it nice and smooth. Here we've got a couple pictures of that process. They're mixing the epoxy here, getting it ready. And using a gun to to fill the slots with epoxy. So he's in the process of filling this slot, and the perpendicular slot has already been filled and ready for the FRP rods. Next, now that we have our slots cut and filled with epoxy, we would be placing the rods in the slots. So we'll push them down into the slots filled with epoxy. And then top off the slots after the rod is in there. And you'll end up with a product, finished product such as this. And for case study number one, that's it. That's, that's the finished product. Um, I will move on to the case study number two. So case study number two, again, staying with the uh, parking structure theme. There's a parking structure in Minnesota located in St. Paul. Um, this one was uh, the FRP used on this was a variety of both CFRP fabric for sheer strength, strengthening of beams and joists. Um, also near surface mounted CFRP was also used. Uh, and in this case, or the previous case study was it was used to bring the structure up to current codes here it was used because of actually reinforcing steel damage from cutting so just quick overview of the project um, this is a blow grade parking structure um, pan and joy slab construction um, constructed in the 1960s um, Originally, there was one level below grade and one level on grade, and here the upper level now has been made into a plaza. Um, this plaza is currently undergoing renovations and redesigns, so it includes things like you know new drive lanes and planters, etc., to the top of the structure, and all of this kind of changes the loading on the structure. Um, the scope for that renovation includes removing removal of an exist, existing topping slab, um, rewaterproofing, and then 
adding the new the new features and then also repairing and strengthening the supporting structure beneath. So focusing here on the repair and strengthening of the supporting structure, um, it included conventional concrete repairs, uh, st structural crack repair with epoxy injection, um, also had some corrosion mitigation as far as um, we used galvanic anodes in patch repairs and also hybrid fusion style anodes in areas of sound concrete with active corrosion. Um, slab strengthening um, with steel plates was done and also some structural strengthening with CFRP, which is what we'll be talking about going forward here. Um, there was shear strengthening of joists and beams, also the near surface mounted laminate for that demolition damage for damage from saw cutting of reinforcing steel in the slab. Um, also here, CFRP fire protection. Um, so fire protection over the CFRP was installed at select locations. So oh, here's some pictures of the other repair scope, scopes, you know, typically done before your FRP. You want to make sure everything's nice and sound before you're installing your FRP. Now we had concrete repairs to joists and slab. Um, typically we'd have some galvanic anodes and the concrete repairs to take care of that corrosion. We also had epoxy, epoxy injection for crack repairs in the center here. And then the steel plates for slab strengthening and adding section. So the steel plates were put up and grouted behind to add section and strength to the slab in certain areas. So getting the FRP design and drawings here for this project. So this structural analysis was completed prior to the project and the areas that required strengthening based on the new loads of the structure were determined. So here we have areas in green where the joist shear strengthening with CFRP was required and areas in blue here where the beam shear strengthening with CFRP was required. After that, the areas um, were selected here, a detailed design was completed for the CFRP strengthening. Um, we've got our beam strengthening detail on the left here. See the wrap, the U-wrap shape for the CFRP, and also using some CFRP anchors to help that bond at each edge of the CFRP. Then on the joist strengthening detail here, we've got our joist strengthening and the detail section details for that strengthening. And it consisted of variations of here is two L wraps actually shown, it's tough to see, or in certain areas, we also had just a full U wrap. Kind of skip back and forth between the surface mounted application and the near surface mounted. And here's our, our design for that near surface mounted. So again, like the last project we're doing some slots in certain areas in both directions. So we've got one slot below and one slot above as shown in the detail here. So certain slots have to be deeper than others. So now that we have our design, we have to lay it out on the structure. Um, so for this project, the final location of the beam strengthening was actually determined by, by the stirrups, the existing steel locations in the structure. Um, and these two pictures were locating the stirrups with GPR and determining the spacing. So here you can see the, the tighter spacing and where it transitions to the wider spacing. And that's we use that to determine um, the final location of the, of the uh, shear strengthening. And for the near surface mounted, we also have our layout. Here, chalk lines are snapped in both directions, going this way and this way. And the lines have been clear coated over um, to prevent them from washing out as I start wet cutting.
So while you're laying out these locations, you may find some areas with obstructions or where adjustments are needed. And this is very common on an FRP project. So here are areas where the plans indicated um, FRP. So this beam area was one of them as identified by our high tech duct tape is that area was to get FRP. Um, there's quite a bit of conduit and sprinkler pipes and that kind of thing in this area, which made installing the FRP difficult. In certain certain instances, that can be moved or pulled off the surface of the concrete during the installation project process. Other times it can't, and you might need to make adjustments for they're moving FRP strengthening one direction or the other, or adding more layers in areas where you can get it to increase strength. Um, so that can also, that's also worked through with the engineer and the FRP designer. And then on the right, we have another area where some adjustments were needed. Uh, and we've got our high tech duct, duct tape to indicate the area where we're putting FRP. And this was supposed to be that U-wrap design that we had looked at earlier. So it's supposed to go all the way up into the bay between the two joists here. And it just happened that in this location, that joist was right in the center where we wanted to put that FRP. So it's just some simple adjustments um, with the designer just to confirm um, the next step. If we split it on each side of the joist, remove it one direction or the other, um, that kind of thing. But there are typically some adjustments that are required before you actually get started with installing the FRP. So now that we've got it all laid out, uh, we're getting ready to go here. We've got containment set up because we're about to start surface prep and that can get pretty messy. Uh, it's grinding or blasting, so you typically make a lot of dust. Um, so in areas, parking garages, you don't wanna get people's cars full of dust or the building or anything like that. Uh, it's nice to set, off this, set up this containment. We do use special equipment to kind of minimize that dust and mitigate it, but there's, it's impossible to mitigate the dust 100%. So it's always good to set up that containment. So now we're ready to start our surface prep here. And uh, with FRP, along we had mentioned the sharp corners um, before in the surface prep slides, uh, we also inside corners um, need to be taken care of. So here we have this inside corner, we're trying to wrap our U-wrap up and over this. Um, so that needs to be taken care of and make a nice smooth rounded corner and ramp to get, to get that FRP to transition smoothly up onto the next surface. So here we can see our ramp has been formed and poured. Um, also these certain sharp corners and form lines like we see in the picture on the left here, we've got a nice, nice form line there and a sharp corner need to be smoothed out as in this picture. Typically consists of grinding for the corners and the surfaces to get it smooth. So here he's grinding and we get our nice rounded corner in this picture and nice smooth surface ready to go for FRP. So jumping back to that near surface mounted surface prep, uh, after the lines have been marked, we've got them saw cut here and cleaned out and ready for the FRP to go in. Now that we've got everything prepped, uh, it's time to start cutting. So here they're measuring out pieces, the guys cutting on the floor here and on the table, we're measuring out pieces and cutting. You can see the stack stack of cut pieces, stack of cut material on the floor here, ready to go. So now that we got our FRP cut and ready, and we've got our, our joists here, nice and smooth, form line smoothed out and corners rounded. We'll prime that surface with epoxy, let it get nice and tacky. Once it's nice and tacky and we've got our saturated FRP fabric ready to go, we'll start installing that. Here you can see he's installing these L wraps from one side and now he's got to come back to the other side, install the L wraps going the other way to fully wrap this joist. Just 
just some more pictures of the installation process. We've got one joist here, all completely wrapped, and they're letting the other one get nice and tacky before they move on to installing fabric in that one. And then here they're wrapping the FRP onto the beam structure. And we'll see these. We'll go to the next picture, but here are those those uh, fan, those FRP anchors that we had looked at in that design detail. So at each beam location, beam wrap location, uh, received two FRP anchors up at the top. So those are installed by drilling a hole and filling it with ep epoxy and embedding these the tails of these FRP anchors into that hole and then spreading the FRP strands out and epoxying them to the surface of the FRP wrap, just to give it a nice solid bond. Just a picture showing how the FRP can be installed in some pretty tight spaces. There are a few of them in this structure, and here uh, he's working out of a lift and uh, had to get up in between all these kind of pipes and hangers uh, on the ceiling. And he's also using a tool here to uh, push the FRP fabric back up nice and really push it up against the surface of the concrete back in this area, which is above this kind of door, this roll up garage door. Uh, so we can't, you need a tool to get back in there, but uh, certain tight spaces are doable to get FRP in. Once all the FRP is installed, we install our fire protection coating in the areas where it's specified. Here he's put, putting this cementitious fireproofing coating over top of the FRP. And quality control uh, was done on this project uh, like any other FRP project. Here we've got some examples of that bond testing on this structure. Um, here, uh, we definitely note when we pull off the, uh, the slide earlier where we saw that concrete substrate, here we're seeing um, all epoxy. So, so we've got all epoxy there, which, which can indicate some issues or it might just be, it might be fine and, and typically further testing is needed to confirm that or we look at our pull strength here and I don't know, um, this doesn't exactly correlate with this sample, but this would be an example if you do get epoxy pulled off and you're not seeing any substrate, but you do meet your bond requirements. So you are over that 200 PSI, um, everything could be just fine. But if you do further testing and you decide that there was a bond issue or something, um, typical repairs you know, may need to be done. Um, and it's not common, but it does happen that maybe it, towards the end of one batch of epoxy mix, it started to set up on you or something, or you didn't get that that bond that you wanted. Um, so here we have a picture of him cutting off some areas that were not bonded correctly, and they're gonna reprep and reinstall the FRP in this area once they figure out the extents of the issue. And here we have a picture of a near complete, uh, near surface mounted FRP. And again, this was the laminate strips. They were three eighths of an inch on this application. And they're installed in these epoxy filled channels and they've been topped off. So most of them have been completed in this direction. Now they're gonna start working on these other ones here that cross. And then when everything is said and done here, we'll end up with a finished projects such as this. We did quite a few joists in the structure, as you can see, and then also quite a few locations of the beam wrap here. And that concludes that case study. Um, definitely feel free to ask any questions or looking forward to the questions here now. Uh, hopefully that was helpful and uh, I did Try it. it is kind of focused from the installer point of view, um, but please let us know if you have any questions. Well, you asked for it uh, there, Andrew. <laughs> I have a feeling there might be quite a few. <laughs> we have lots and lots of questions here, so I'm just going to, it's going to be unfair to, to everybody because there's so many here, um, but uh, I'll try to get through as many as we can in the short period of time that we have left. 
Um, let's uh, let's see what we can do here. Uh, our friend Fred Nelson uh, is is curious about uh, what additional measures are needed. And this seemed to be a common question as well. But what additional measures are needed for FRP and reinforcement to satisfy fire protection requirements? Sure. So it varies. It varies on manufacturer recommendations and codes and and, and what fire protection is needed. But typically, um, as we saw there, it's a cementitious mortar like in its troweled on over top of the FRP. And I believe it's usually, I think, 40 mils to an eighth of an inch or so thick. Oh, it would obviously depend on the code and depending on the application, I would imagine. Yep. Uh, okay, Anonymous is curious uh, about um, for for application, can it be used in to strengthen buried pipes for eventual new uh, road loads, say an LRT or heavy tr haul trucks? Can you actually strengthen pipes in ground? Yes, I'm sure. I know we were discussing earlier, we've strengthened culverts and pipes in the ground. I know it is definitely a possibility in it. Yeah. OK, well, more details then for anonymous uh, to come. Um, Ryan is, is asking, um, can you comment on how much thickness uh, this goes back to the fire resistance? Uh, how, how much thickness is required? You said 40 millimeters. Uh, it's, it probably uh, ranges 40. between very thin and very thick, correct? Yeah, it depends on the, the manufacturer, the product that you use. But it typically, I think what we're looking at here is like 40 mils to an eighth of an inch or so. Um, Along those lines, I'm sure it can vary if you if you have some special conditions, but that's I, I would say typical of the installations that we see. Okay, Dan is asking. Dan Hayes is asking if the material is sensitive to high temperatures, would fires affect its power? Oh, this is a, a, a same question for fire. Sorry, I missed that one. Okay, here we go. There's a good one from Matt. Um, could you provide a rough percentage breakdown estimate for the construction costs of a ver of various strengthening steps? So, for example, is 50% of the cost service prep? Is 25% material install, et cetera, et cetera? Just off the top of your head, do you have a grasp of that? So, 50, yeah, I would say, yeah, I mean, the material and, you know, would be a third, maybe 33% and the labor and prep and everything would be two, two thirds. It, it obviously depends very much on access and, and what it takes to get there. And obviously with trickier access, the install times and labor can be more um, intensive and more important. Alrighty. That. Well, we could, we could always address uh, more specifics offline yep. for sure. Every project is different. That's always the, the standard yep. line, but uh, yeah, that's the standard line. typical two thirds to one third. Um, Marta is, is asking, is special uh, is special inspection required for the installation process? So we're talking about QA, QC now. Is it periodic or continuous? Does the uh, engineer of record require, um, uh, is, is an engineer of record required to perform uh, construction observation in most cases? That varies definitely on the project, as we just kind of mentioned before. But um, I would say we've we've seen projects with no quality control steps specified in the specifications. We've also seen it where the quality control has to be done by a third party. Um, so typically it definitely varies. I would say most projects do require some level of quality control. Um, usually we'll do it ourselves and hand port the installer will conduct the quality control and hand the reports into the engineer. Um, but in certain cases also engineers or third parties may do the quality control steps. Okie doke. Uh, back to Fred Nelson. Um, this is more of a very specific question with a little bit of a preamble. Uh, we spe he says, we specify one inch deep strips to stitch concrete cracks together, but our contractors tell us that they need to pre-score, then snap and score the, mar uh, and and the score marks to get the correct width. Are one inch FRP strips available somewhere or, or, um, or do the contractors still have to basically make a smaller width of strip out of a larger one? So that would be, it depends. Um, I'm sure it varies on manufacturer and what's available. Um, I would think if one inch strips are available, but as you see in the case study we just did, we also actually doubled up these smaller, the thinner strips. Um, so that's an option. 
OK, so you can uh, double answers. them up as well. Yeah. Uh, Anonymous is curious about, um, is there a way to apply a coding that can accept aggregate to the surface of an FRP uh, of FRP to accept a stucco finish if you need to match the existing adjacent textures uh, of a structure? So if you're doing it, let's say a wall, for example. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand that question here. Um, I, I believe so. I know there have been instances where we've broadcast like sand or sand or something to give a little bit more texture in the top of that FRP um, epoxy. Uh, so it was definitely, you can definitely have many different options for coating over top of it. Okay. Uh, what is the depth of the uh, near surface mounted slots relative to the thickness of the GFRP square um, strip? So that, that the, the tape that we'd seen shown in that photo. So the depth, so in this instance, in this case study, this last one, the slots were cut to a depth of five eighths of an inch and the strips were three eighths of an inch tall. Uh, so basically a, an eighth of an inch on either side of the strip. Gotcha, okay. Um, a question from Nagy. Uh, how does the cost of FRP repair work compare to other methods of repair work? And obviously there's probably some trade-offs, but uh, can you give us some insight on the costs? Sure, there's trade-offs and obviously the, the FRP materials and carbon fiber uh, is not cheap. There, you know, there's a cost to them and it, that's why they're used in, you know, things higher end things, like higher end cars and that kind of thing. But um, you know where you save a lot is is labor and access and equipment so so if it's something that's really easy you can walk up to it and put a steel beam in um, and it's easy to get to and you're not worried about clearance issues um, the steel beam in that case may be cheaper but if you have to get up you know 100 feet in the air um, you're working out of lifts and stuff and you don't need a crane or or other heavy equipment to get that steel or other options up into place because you're using this lighter weight FRP, then that's where it starts to be more cost effective. Okay, uh, we're closing on time here, so maybe just time for one more. And I don't, this is another anonymous question, but uh, pretty, pretty straightforward one, I think. Uh, can we use uh, the case one application, so the near surface mounted case study you showed, can we use that on concrete walls to increase the flexural capacity? Um, I, I'm going to say I believe so. That would be a question I can follow up with the, the FRP designer, but um, yes, I believe you could. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Andrew. We're, um, we have lots more questions and we have another 10 that just came in. So uh, we have our work out for us here, but um, if you want to be proactive, uh, we can reach out to you. But if you want to be proactive to answer your questions, you can reach out directly to Andrew. His information is on your screen here. I know he'd love to hear from you. So his, uh, oh, you put his mobile number on there and <laughs> be careful with that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that, yeah, that's good. Any, you know, any phone calls or emails, I'm glad to accept them and, and answer your questions if I can. Fantastic. So we'll leave that up there for a second so you can copy it down if you wish. So as I mentioned, this is the sixth and the second last um, uh, parking structure webinar that we're going to be doing here. So the next topic is uh, with uh, Ryan Fleming of Vexor Construction. Uh, he's going to be speaking about concrete repair with uh, carbon fiber tea biscuits for parking structures, which is an innovative method of repairing uh, double T couplers uh, in, in parking structures. So it's, it's very targeted, very unique. Um, we hope you'll join us. And just on the top left hand side of your screen here, you also see um, the previous recording of the evaluation repair protection and of unbonded post tensioning in parking structures by Mike Kernan that was done in January a month ago. Um, his presentation is already up there uh, on the We Save Structures website. So feel free to go there and download the slides or the uh, presentation if you wish to view that. Yeah. But that's it for today, guys. So. Um, Thank you all for, for, for joining us. First and foremost, actually, thank you to, to Andrew for, for dedicating his time here today and sharing his experience and his expertise with, with all of us. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. And again, thank you to all of you uh, for spending your day with us and uh, learning about uh, carbon fiber strengthening, and hopefully you can go out there and, and save some structures. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time, which is, again, our last webinar of, uh, of this series. So uh, we hope to see you then. Take care. Be safe.